Joining me today is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future, Martin Ford, welcome to the Rubin Report. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to have you here, sir, because dystopian futures, robots, Skynet, all of it, very much in my wheelhouse and I want you to explain it all to me. Are you ready? Yes, definitely. All right, let's do it. So uh, first off, before we dive directly into robots and AI and all that, uh, just tell me a little bit about your background, what brought you to writing a book like this. Okay, so I studied computer engineering in college and then I worked as an engineer, a design engineer for several years. Um, then I went back and studied business. Eventually I ended up starting and running a small software company up in Silicon Valley. and. I ran that for many years, but even in the course of running that, I saw the impact that, that all this technology was having on, on jobs at my business and at businesses like it. And that really got me thinking about this issue. And so about 10 years ago in 20, um, 2009, I wrote uh, my first book called The Lights in the Tunnel, which really argued that artificial intelligence was going to be the next big thing in computing and that it was going to have a dramatic impact in particular on the job market. And, and that book did well enough that it led to an opportunity to write this book in 2015, which really got you know, quite a bit of attention. And since then, I've kind of shifted my career to really be a futurist focused on what AI and robotics means for society and for the economy and, and especially for the job market. So I think there are going to be some huge challenges there for us. Right. So we're going to unpack all of that stuff. But when you were writing about this in 2009, were people saying, nah, this is just pure science fiction? Yeah, I mean, I, I, this was an issue that was very much off the radar back then. Um, it came with a fair amount of stigma and, stigma. and the reason is that this concern or fear that machines might take a lot of jobs and there might be unemployment, it's, it's an old issue. It's come up many times in the past, mm -hmm. going all the way back to the Luddites, right, in England 200 years ago. And so there's actually this term, neo-Luddite, for, for a person that, that is once again worrying about this issue, and, and so it was quite stigmatized. Um, so in 2009, when I wrote the book, um, you know, I was one of the, the earliest people to get out there with this, but since then, things have definitely changed. And I see a lot of people much more concerned about this, even professional economists and so forth. So there definitely has been a shift in mentality over this last 10 years when we've seen things like, like the advent of, of self-driving cars that mm -hmm. look like they're gonna be arriving soon and so forth. What, were, what markers were you seeing back in 2009 or a little bit before that even that were sort of pushing you in this direction? Well, the, the most important thing is what you might call Moore's Law, the fact that, that the power of computers is accelerating, doubling every two years. And it was obvious that computers were going to get dramatically more powerful. And there had to be an application for that. It has to be something you can do with that. And it, it became obvious to me that artificial intelligence was going to be the thing. And, and AI means essentially solving the same kinds of problems that the human brain can solve, right? And it means machines that in a limited sense are taking on cognitive capability. They're beginning to think. And that means that technology is going to begin to compete with and substitute for human, be uh, human beings in, in, in a unique way, something that we've never seen before. And as that scales across the whole economy, as all kinds of jobs, skilled jobs and unskilled jobs, I think that... Um, it becomes pretty clear that, that you know, it's going to have dramatic implications. So when people think about robots, I think like there's a, there's a few different ways you can think about this. You can sort of think about AI, which is sort of this amorphous thing that people sort of don't contextualize into a physical object. But then they think of robots, they think of like, you know, C-3PO and R2-D2 and everything else. Um, what, if you were just saying robots, what, what exactly are you talking about? Right. It, I, especially in this book, Rise of the Robots, I used a very broad meaning for that, basically yeah. to mean anything that is, is automating something and taking over you know, things that people can do. And very often that's just going to be software. Um, if you want to be more precise and technical, a robot is when you take artificial intelligence and you put it into a physical machine that can physically manipulate the environment. Mm -hmm. But what we're talking about is much broader than that. Um, so we're going to, you know, we're, we're already seeing people like lawyers and doctors being impacted. And it's not physical robots, it's mm -hmm. often just software, artificial intelligence. Um, and actually, the, you know, building physical robots that have dexterity, that can manipulate the, the environment, that's actually one of the hardest aspects of this. And in some ways, that where it may be where progress is gonna be slowest, where in knowledge type work, you know, someone that's sitting in front of a computer doing some routine task, cranking out the same report, again and again, that may actually be much easier 
to automate than, than something physical. So that's interesting. So the, the idea part of it is easier to replicate than the physical part, even though you'd think that just building a robot that can move the way you want it to move or something, so that seems technically easier than figuring out how to think like humans, no? It, it, it seems like that from our perspective. Very often the, the reason is that to do these knowledge-based jobs requires a lot of education and training, right? Um, but actually once you implement the technology, it actually can often be the, the reverse. The hardest thing to do is to build a physical robot that has dexterity, that has visual perception, that can, can move around the way a person does. To, to build, as you right. said, the kind of robot like C-3PO from Star Trek. That's totally science fiction. We don't have anything right. remotely like that. It seems uh, like we're kind of, every now and again you see a video on YouTube where they're getting a little closer. You know, they've got a right. robot, you, you know, jumping over something and ducking under something. Ex exactly, you see those robots in particular from a company called Boston Dynamics. Mm -hmm. It's doing very impressive things, but those videos are highly choreographed. Um, the robots are controlled by someone that's outside the picture. Mm -hmm. This is not a thinking autonomous robot running around doing stuff by itself. That's okay, so we're not we're not in, in Terminator land just yet. Not not anytime soon at all. That's far in the future. But that you know, we shouldn't allow we shouldn't be distracted from the fact that there are things happening now that are going to have a really dramatic impact, but it's not the science fiction stuff that you see in the iRobot movie but, and, and stuff like that. Right, so how much of the conversation is about all of this is about what you referenced a moment ago about just the speed of technology and that every two years the power doubles and all that, that we're all walking around with iPhones or, some, you know, we have supercomputers in our pocket and the way we can transmit information across the globe like that and, and just, how much of this is just related to speed more than right, anything that, else? Right, that's, you know, a, a very big part of it is not just the speed of computers that have gotten faster and smaller, of course, and now they're in our iPhones, but um, it's the speed of communications bandwidth, it's memory capacity. So we've seen this very broad-based acceleration in technology, and that's a huge part of it. Um, the other thing is that, that there have been some breakthroughs in, in artificial intelligence, especially in the hottest area of AI, which is called deep learning or deep neural networks. We've seen dramatic progress there, and that's the thing that's really revolutionizing um, the field and, and the other thing that's happened is that we are now throughout our whole economy and society collecting huge amounts of data, right? There's all this data out there that, that wasn't there before and this data is basically the resource that is used to train these smart algorithms and, mm -hmm. and that's what artificial intelligence looks like right now. It's primarily machine learning. Um, and this is just going to be incredibly disruptive. Yeah, so is part of the potential problem here that we're building things that will be more powerful than us, and we don't really understand that. So it's like we're putting so much information in our brains all the time. Maybe our actual physical brains can't take all this in. Like we don't have enough RAM in our physical brains for all of the information that we're constantly slamming ourselves with. Well, it's definitely true that these smart algorithms, I mean, they can look at, you know, huge amounts of data, millions and millions and millions of data points, right, um, which no human being could do. So we already have algorithms that in a very narrow sense, in terms of doing very specific things, are superhuman, right? They can vastly outperform um, what any person does, um, and they do things that we don't really understand. A good example of that would be Wall Street, right? Where you've got these trading algorithms that can actually look at machine-readable news. I mean, uh, companies like Bloomberg actually make uh, news products that are designed for machines, not for people. Mm -hmm. These algorithms can read that news and then analyze it and then trade on it within, you know, tiny fractions of a second. So that would be an example of, of where technology is already getting ahead of what we can understand. Yeah. Um, what do we do to rein some of it back in occasionally? You well, know, is, you know, is there any, or is it just once we start the process with anything like this, we just don't know where it ends? You know, it, it's a difficult question. Um, you know, there are going to be places where we're going to need regulation. Um, you can't just rein it in. I mean, it's progress. It's happening. It's, it's happening in part because of a competitive dynamic, right, within capitalism, between companies, between Google and Facebook and Goldman Sachs, all competing to build um, the latest technology. There's also a competition between the United States and China. Um, all of that is going to push it forward relentlessly and trying to stop it um, it's probably kind of a fool's errand. Um, it's probably not possible and, and probably not, not really advisable. What I think we have to do are find ways to adapt to all of this progress. And in some places that may mean certainly regulation. Um, and in other cases it will 
mean finding ways to address issues like unemployment and inequality that will um, result from all of this progress. Yeah, so let's just define some basic terms because I think we end up throwing out a lot of big terms here and then people are confused. So just, when people are talking about the algorithm, can you just explain in simple terms, what is the algorithm? Well, an algorithm- Because we're doing this on YouTube right now. Right, people right. are always obsessed with the algorithm. An algorithm is just essentially a computer program. It's something that goes step by step and, and does something. Um, what we've seen recently though is the emergence of a new kind of algorithm called machine learning algorithms. And this is what's really disruptive. And the difference between a machine learning algorithm and a traditional computer programming uh, algorithm is that, that you know, historically some programmer has, has sat down and told the computer to do what to do step by step. Mm -hmm. With machine learning, instead you've got a smart algorithm that looks at lots and lots of data and then figures out for itself what to do. So in essence, it's kind of program, it's, program it's itself, right? Yeah. Um, so, so is there a way to control it then? Well, or you, you, is it just actually uncontrollable because once, once it's learned enough, it just doesn't need the program. Well, it's not anymore. so much that it's uncontrollable, but that you know we don't really want to control it. The whole point is to to unleash it and let it learn and, and, and do things. That doesn't mean that it's in any sense out of control or it's a danger to yeah. us or anything like well, that. Well, I would. I, the reason I was asking was sort of through a through a YouTube algorithm lens. Like one of the things we're finding out is they just want to keep you clicking all the time. Right. You know where we put out a long form show, people are going to watch a full hour of our discussion. That's not really what the algorithm wants. It wants you from the way we understand it from some insiders, they want you to constantly be clicking on videos and f basically fall into this click hole to just keep the machine going more and more and more. Now I understand why they want that sort of attention going in different places and all that. Um, but for what I do, I don't love the algorithm at the moment, if that makes right, sense. Right, right, so that depends on how they optimize the algorithm. But what's happening there is that you've got millions and millions of people watching YouTube videos and if they watch an entire video, then that will create a data point that says, you know, they were really interested in this. If they, mm -hmm. if they start watching, and you know, for a brief time and then they click away, then it'll show that they're less interested. And then an algorithm comes around and looks at millions of those data points, and and can make recommendations for other videos. And and as you said, I think what what we've seen is that the the videos shown to people become more extreme, right? So if you're interested in something and then you'll get a more extreme version of that and, and that's how to get people to click. And a lot of people have been, you know, raising the alarm over that because that is kind of radicalizing people, mm -hmm. right? So what do you do about that? If you're if you're a programmer and you're at YouTube and you don't want people to be radicalized or just you don't even if you just don't want people to have to just be endlessly clicking, like there's this game to keep people addicted to all of right. these things. And it's like I understand that we could put out a zillion clips so I could you know, I could chop everything into two minute things and we could put them out and it would probably help us in terms of views and all of those things. Um, but I just don't want to play that game sort of. Right, right. Technically, I don't think that's a difficult problem. That, that depends on what the designer wants to do. The, but the whole problem is that the algorithms are designed to make the most money for Google, right? right. And that, that's what's driving this. So it's not, uh, I don't think it's a computer design problem. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a capitalism problem, a profitability problem. It's the fact that, that Google is a, a publicly traded company and it, it, you know, its investors want it to make as much money as possible. And that's what drives it to design algorithms that maximize profitability. So that keep you clicking. That, that may be the kind of place where maybe some regulation has to come in and say, you know, well, you're gonna have to put some constraint on this um, if, if Google doesn't make the decision to do that itself. Right? Yeah, I mean, this is where I'm not a regulation guy, but it's like they're pushing me to my limits. I mean, this is what I keep saying about all the tech companies right now when it comes to censorship and everything else. It's like, they're not giving us much of a choice here. Right, I mean, it, it's a challenging problem for sure to, to figure out, you know, for AI to figure out what's in a video and in terms of is there something there that should be censored or not. That's the decision they're making. And that's, that's quite different from, from just optimizing getting people to watch mm -hmm. videos because in order to do that, you don't, you don't care what's in the video. That's the whole problem, right? right. It's just tracking statistics. But if you actually want to analyze what's in a video, is there something in there that is dangerous? Are you inciting people to violence or something like that? For artificial intelligence to figure that out is still much, much harder. And yeah. that, that, that's why we're running into this problem, I think. So how is deep learning different than artificial intelligence? That's, that, well, that's just the next level of artificial well, intelligence? Well, deep basically? learning is a kind of, of artificial intelligence. It's right now the hottest 
area of AI, and deep learning or deep neural networks basically means a system that is loosely designed on the way a brain would work. It has artificial neurons that are roughly similar to, to the neurons in your brain, and, and that's the way it works. Um, and this is an idea that's been around you know, for, since the 1950s at least. Um, but just within the last six years or so, we've seen just an explosion in this technology. Um, and we've now got systems that can translate languages um, from Chinese to English that can do better than people at recognizing visual images. We've got radiology systems that can look at medical images and find cancer there, and in some cases can do that better than human doctors. Mm -hmm. So this is absolutely the, absolutely the hottest area of AI. It's um, also what's enabling self-driving cars, for example. Um, so is this the great catch-22? Of, of all of robotics is that it's doing these incredible things and then as you talk about in the book it's going to put a lot of people out of work at the well same time. I, I think that's one of the the real problems with it I mean and, and you know we're ultimately going to have to make a choice as to whether we want to allow that progress to continue and get the enormous benefits of that progress but if that's going to come at a cost of, of making some set of our population unemployable or, or maybe de-skilling jobs to the point where people just don't have adequate incomes even if they don't even if they do have a job mm -hmm. um, then we've got to find a way to adapt to that right and that's why for example i've talked a lot about a, a universal basic income as yeah. one possible approach to that um, but i'm very much against the idea that we should stop progress because this is where we are you know yeah. this is what is progress there... is going to look like in the future and we we don't want to stop it because progress is the thing that has made us better off over is there any the evidence that century. ever in history you could stop progress actually and even if we wanted to stop it right, right now let's say you laid out the greatest case why this thing is going to run out of control it's going to put half of us out of business you know income inequality is going to go crazy poverty etc cetera, etc cetera. is there any case where technology existed that we somehow put the put the brakes on it I'd be quite skeptical that we'd be able to do that. Um, again, in part because of competition, not, not just between companies, but between countries. Maybe we would do it, but then China didn't put the brakes on and they would pretty soon be vastly ahead of us, right? So mm -hmm. that would be a problem. Is that the catch-22 then for regulation? Because it's like, we may try to regulate some of it, but if China's not regulating it or if they're exactly. doing it that, that's way. one of you know that's one of the biggest problems is that you would, you would put um, your country at a disadvantage unless you could do it on a global basis and of course doing anything on a global basis is incredibly hard as you see with climate change for example mm -hmm. um, so again my perspective is that rather than trying to slow it down what we should do is find a way to adapt to it let just let it run but understand what the implications are going to be and figure out a way to adapt to that. And, yeah. and that's where the idea of a basic income comes in. So I want to talk a little bit more about UBI, but before we do that, can you talk a little bit just about how this has affected certain industries and how some industries haven't quite been affected yet? Right, so in general, the point I would make is that it's going to affect everything. I mean, artificial intelligence is going to be like a utility. It's going to be like electricity, right? And no one says, what industries are most impacted by electricity. Right. I, mean, I mean, you know, right. everything relies on electricity, right? And the same will be true of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So um, in the long run, it's everywhere. Um, in, in the near term, clearly, you know, manufacturing has already been impacted by automation generally. We've seen a dramatic decrease in advanced countries and the number of people employed in manufacturing. And that's going to continue. Um, the robots and the automation used in factories are going to get a lot more effective, more dexterous they'll be able to do the jobs that, that right now only people can do. Um, but it's going to scale to many, many other areas. In finance, um, it's going to have a dramatic impact. A lot of white-collar jobs there where people are sitting in front of a computer cranking out reports or something, right? Um, recently, I saw something that the CEO of uh, Deutsche Bank, one of the big banks, said he thought he could get rid of half of his employees in the relatively near future huh. using, using this technology. Um, healthcare is an, is an area where it's going to be slower because it's really hard. You've got doctors and nurses that need to engage with patients on a one-on-one -on -one basis, right, mm -hmm. and provide a lot of individual human-like service. Um, and it's been, and that's one of the reasons that healthcare costs are so high in the United States right now because we have not seen the kind of productivity increases there that we've seen in, say, manufacturing. Right. But so it, what, what could we do to see that change well, we're, in healthcare? We're, we're beginning to see evidence of that. As I mentioned, you've got systems now that can read medical images. So you're going to begin to see 
Um, the introduction of artificial intelligence in medicine, I don't think that it will, for the most part, at least in the near term, it's not going to completely replace doctors, mm -hmm. but it will become kind of a second opinion. Um, it will run alongside a doctor, you know, will always be there. It will make um, every doctor be able to perform at the level of the best doctor, mm -hmm. right? Because, because there'll be this incredible intelligence there. So that will be of enormous benefit. Um, there and, then, already, and then eventually, if you just extrapolate that down the road, it could replace the doctor too, right? I mean, sure, you could have robots doing eventually, surgery, I, like in the movie Alien and a, and a million other things. Exactly, um, although I would say in general, doctors are relatively safe because they are highly regulated, right? There are all kinds of rules about medicine and, and you need to have a doctor or, or a pharmacist there and, and those kinds. So those roles are relatively protect, protected where if you're a white collar job in some corporation sitting in a cubicle somewhere, you don't have any protections at all. So for that reason, um, I would worry a bit less about doctors uh, disappearing in, in, in the inner term. But mm -hmm. you know, in healthcare, there definitely are gonna be lots of applications. You already see robots in hospitals delivering things. Um, you see robots beginning to be used in elder care, looking after older people, which mm -hmm. is certainly one of the biggest opportunities because we have this aging population. Um, pharmacy robots are a huge thing. There are already robots that do you know, thousands and thousands of prescri prescriptions in, in hospitals mm -hmm. and so forth very efficiently. So this is coming. Um, it will take a little bit longer in healthcare than in some other areas, um, but eventually it's going to be everywhere. Um, in retail, you know, they're, they're, uh, Walmart is beginning to introduce uh, robots. And of course, retail in general is migrating more and more toward Amazon. Yeah. Um, which in theory means that jobs, you know, they might move from a retail store to an Amazon warehouse, but once the jobs go to that Amazon warehouse, now they're in a very controlled environment, mm -hmm. and, and there are already lots of robots there, and those robots are gonna get dramatically better in the next five or 10 years. You know, so in effect, you could have a giant Amazon warehouse that we've all driven by one of these, these huge monstrosities, and it could basically be run by all robots, well, and you're are, are getting ordering very close things to that, online. Yeah. Definitely a lot fewer people. I mean, right now inside those robots, inside those warehouses, you have huge numbers of robots. Mm -hmm. And the robots will do something like bring a whole shelf of inventory to a worker, but then the worker's gotta reach in there and grab the item off the shelf mm -hmm. and put it in a box, because the robot right now can't do that. It doesn't have the visual perception and the dexterity to do that. Yeah. But that will change over the next five to 10 years. And so those environments are gonna become a lot less labor intensive. That's not to say they'll be fully automated, but there are gonna be fewer jobs there. and that's something to worry about because this is one of the brightest areas right now for job creation, right? So we're, gonna, so we're gonna watch a certain sector or many sectors of jobs just disappear altogether and yet at the same time, I guess the counter argument or the people that would say we shouldn't be so alarmed about this would say, well, all the cost of everything will go down because the robots will be able to do things at a much more efficient, cheaper level, right? So people won't need as much uh, disposable income, that sort of thing. That's right, I mean, and that, that's absolutely true. There, I, I'm very skeptical that that kind of solves the problem though. I mean, you can think about it. If you don't have a job at all, then your income is zero. It doesn't matter it how, it doesn't matter how, how cheap, cheap stuff is. is. Yeah. The other thing is that the really big ticket items, the things that really are putting people underwater are housing, education, healthcare. And these are exactly the areas where um, technology is, at least in the short and medium, term gonna have the least impact, right? I mean, housing in particular, someday we might have big 3D printers that make it really cheap to produce housing, but, but there's still a problem with land, right? And if you're in Los Angeles or, or up in San Francisco, then there's no land left, right? right? It's already, you know, you know, it's already very scarce and, and that's what drives property values so high. So you, you can't solve that problem necessarily just with technology. Yeah. So as incomes fall, um, you know, many people are not, going to have the income to really cover the, the basics, and that, that's going to be a big problem. Okay, so that's the right transition then to universal basic income. So my, my default position on UBI, and I've heard arguments on both sides, and I, I think I told you I have Andrew Yang coming in soon, and we'll discuss it further. My default position is that if you give people just enough to survive, that you're sort of stealing just like the most basic human right of just like go get something for yourself and that it's gonna create this class of people, sort of not by their own fault, that will just have the bare minimum to get by and then they'll be able to stay at home and play video games and watch porn and basically do nothing all day long. And, we'll, and that's actually taking something from them rather than giving something 
to them. That's sort of my sort of like high level philosophic position on it. Right. I, I, the argument I would make is that once a society reaches a certain level of prosperity, as we have, um, if you want to continue to have capitalism and a market, it's very important to have the kind of incentive that, that you're alluding to there. Yeah. But I would argue that maybe the incentive doesn't have to be so daunting that if you don't work, you're living on the street or eating out of garbage cans, mm -hmm. right? That, that maybe it's enough to say that you can basically survive if, if you're not motivated, but you're not going to have a terrific life. You're not going to have a great life. And I think that, that a number of studies have been done with basic income that show that when you give people this money, they don't, in fact, just drop out and stay home and do nothing. They are actually motivated to do something more. Um, they invest in their family and education. They work if they can. They maybe start a small business. So actually, if you give people that basic safety net, um, you can create an environment where people are actually more willing to take risks. So, for example, they might start a new business. They might be willing to leave a safe job where they're not learning anything, they're not growing, and work for a startup company, do something more risky. Right. Um, but, but is the inherent problem that then if they start getting some success, then they lose the UBI? And no, that, no, no. That, See, that's, that's yeah. the whole key so this, yeah, yeah. to a basic income, and that's what makes it different from other forms of safety net, is that it is unconditional mm -hmm. in the sense that everyone gets it. Now, what that means is that if I get my basic income and I choose to just play video games, then I'll have that basic income. But if someone else is more ambitious, they get their basic income and they go and work, even if it's only part-time, they start a small business, then they, they get the basic income and they also get that additional income. I mean, we don't tax it away, at least not at, at the lower level. Mm -hmm. So the key point is that the person that is productive, that is willing to do something to work, will always be better off than the person that does nothing. Right? And that's really key to it because um, the problem with our existing social safety net is exactly what you said, that if you do something, find a job, then you lose those benefits. Yeah, and, and, and so, actually, that, so that the cliff has to be really high to, to be willing to leave those right, benefits. Right, and that's exactly basically. what's called a poverty trap, right? Is you get yeah. into a situation where you look at the options around you and, and anything you do doesn't make you better off or even makes you worse off and so you're stuck there, you can't move. Mm -hmm. The worst possible example of that in the United States is the social security disability program, right? Which is intended for people to are injured on a job and then they can't work. But actually a lot of people now are gaming it, probably because they're desperate, they need an income. And so they'll go and tell their doctor they've got pain in their back or something and They'll get through the loops and they'll get onto this program, which gives you an income. Mm -hmm. But once you get there, you can't even be seen to be able-bodied. People mm -hmm. are, are worried even to go and work in their garden or something because someone will see them and then they'll lose their benefits, right? Um, so that's a really terrible example of this kind of income, where basic income, we give it to everyone and it's unconditional, and then we, we encourage people to do more, mm -hmm. right? And that, that, that's really important. That's a, one of the strongest arguments for a basic income scheme. Yeah, so let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of it. First off, do you view it as something that would have to be done federally? Because obviously, if you live in Los Angeles or San Francisco, your cost of living is way higher than, say, if you live in Missouri. Right. Uh, so is this, a, is this a federal program? Are we throwing this to the states? Uh, yeah, how, how I, I would imagine it, it needs to be done on a national level, um, and the reason is what you can think of as kind of like the kind of adverse selection problem you get in, in insurance, right? If, if Los Angeles has a basic income, then people all over the country are going to move to Los Angeles to get that, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to show up here and, and, and overwhelm the system. So it needs to be national rather than than local. Right, but what do you do about the disparity in cost of living in all these places? Well, you know, one issue there is that a basic income is mobile, right? So maybe you don't have to live in Los Angeles or San Francisco. You can take your basic income and you can move to Detroit, right? And there you might have a pretty decent life. Um, you, you, you can have housing there much cheaper, right? So mm -hmm. the difference between a basic income and a job is that you can take it everywhere. So people would kind of readjust and they might, some people might choose to leave, leave high cost areas and, and live in cheaper places and so forth. So how do you fund all this? That always is the big one. Are you scrapping all the social programs that exist right now? Or are you taxing billionaires out the wazoo? Some well, combination you, thereof? You know, you, what, you know, what do you think? Definitely you need to raise more revenue. Um, I think inevitably one of the things that, that we are seeing with the economy largely as the result of, of technology is that more and more income is going to capital and less is going to labor. So 
businesses and investors and people like that are getting more income and average working people are getting less. So what that means for the future, I think it's inevitable that we're going to have to tax capital more and labor less. Mm -hmm. um, and that may you know, involve higher business taxes or taxes on the wealthiest people that have access to lot, lots of capital. I mean, that, that's, as a libertarian, you might find that objectionable, but I think it's inevitable. You, ultimately, if you're going to have a taxation scheme, you have to tax the people that have the money, right? You can't, you can't get blood from a rock, as they say, right? Right. So, you know? so how do you decide what the level is? Now, I get you could live in LA and the cost of living is high, and then maybe you'd say, all right, well, I can't, I can't make it here in a way I want to, so I want to go somewhere cheap. But how do you figure out, well, what is it that is the basic stuff? I mean, we're talking, we're you know, it's UBI. So what is the basic stuff that people are supposed to have? Well, I mean, the, in terms of the level of the income, most people are talking about around a thousand dollars a month. Um, Finland had a, an experiment where it was like 600 euros or something. So these are pretty low amounts. I mean, you know, try. Can you imagine living on a thousand dollars a month, right? Not, I not, used to do it. Yeah, it was not but, fun. But it, it's not so easy. So I think one advantage of these programs is that they're going to start at a, at a low level, and we can imagine that as technology advances and, and society becomes more prosperous, that that could be raised over time. But initially, it's going to be a very low level, so I don't think we have to worry too much about destroying the incentive for people to work and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's going to give people a very, very minimal cushion, um, but they're still going to have that incentive to work. Right. To it's work so more. interesting because it just does set all my libertarian bells off that well, the second you give it to somebody, so we give a thousand bucks to everybody, well, immediately you're gonna have politicians saying, this isn't enough, and, it's, and we have to make it more, and we have to make it more, and that, then that becomes the cycle where we're, exactly, we're right, always right. shifting money around, and it's just, because no one's ever gonna, no matter what basic level we get most people to, no one's ever gonna be like, all right, well, we're yeah, okay no, then. That, that, that's a real concern. Um, I would say, though, that you know, a basic income, or, or there are other flavors of it, a guaranteed minimum income, a negative income tax. These are ideas that in the past have been embraced by libertarians. Friedrich Hayek was mm -hmm. a big proponent of, of a guaranteed minimum income. Uh, Milton Friedman was for a negative income tax. And the idea is that you're creating really a market-based safety net, right? Rather than having government um, house people, feed people, uh, control industries or try to take over businesses and run them in a way that artificially creates jobs and so forth. Mm -hmm. Rather than doing that, just give people some money, let them go out and participate in the market. So it actually is a market-oriented libertarian approach to having some kind of, of safety net. But I think you're, the idea of it being politicized, that's a real concern. And one, one thing I actually have suggested in some of my writing is that we might set up a, a separate institution to kind of manage that, maybe something like the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. that would be independent and not part of the political process and might manage the level of, of a basic income because you could actually use it also to, to respond to recessions, for example. If there's an economic downturn, maybe pay people a bit more mm -hmm. and then that would help you get out of the recession, right? That would be kind of a Keynesian response to it. Um, so I think there are a lot of possibilities there, but you're right. We don't we don't want every politician running on the platform of, I will increase your basic income. Right? That that wouldn't be good. So that's right. something. Right. That, and that just strikes about. me as sort of real politic related to all of this. It's just the way people are. Once you give them something, they want more. I don't blame people for that. It's just sort of. It's exactly. just the way so people that, are. That, it's the way politics works. So that's something that we need to think about from the beginning. Yeah. And as I said, you know, maybe put it in the hands of a separate institution. One other thing I proposed is that maybe we can build incentives into a basic income. Um, if people stay in school, pay them a bit more than people that just play video games. Or mm -hmm. if people go and work in the community, you know, help other people, pay, pay them a bit more. So that I think it's really important to have sort of a ladder for people that mm -hmm. they feel they can somehow do better. Because that, I mean, the, the issue you raised everywhere, or raised before that, that we could create this class of people that just you know, do nothing is, is something to be concerned about. But there are, ideas that we can, I think, employ to, to really address that.